All right, so now we're looking at something quite different from the picture that we had so far. This is still an isogeny graph, but we're now looking at isogeny graphs of super singular curves over fp squared. So no longer just fp as we had in the previous um, examples, but this one is over fp. And there's also some difference in how we define things. So let me start with the edges. So what you're seeing here, um, the yellow ones or orange ones are two isogenies and the blue ones are three isogenies. Um, but the definition of the nodes has changed a little bit. So these are elliptic curves over fp squared. And well, as always, there are classes under isomorphisms. But this time the isomorphism is allowed to go over extending fields. So for the seaside graph, we were looking at isomorphisms over fp. And so for instance, an elliptic curve and its twist were two different points. Whereas here, the elliptic curve and its twist, its quadratic twist, would be identified. So we had seen the J invariant in the first talk on, on elliptic curves, or in the, the set of the isogeny talks. And so now each node uniquely corresponds to a J invariant. So that's really the environment, invariant of that isomorphism class. And a nice feature about super singular curves is that all classes have a representative over fp squared. So the j's live in fp squared, well, can also live in fp, of course. Okay, so that is the graph which we're looking at in SIDH. So that's the super singular isogeny Jeffrey Hellman. And there's also a psych, which I had mentioned in the previous talk, which is the super singular isogeny key exchange, which is their submission to the NIST competition. So on a high level, so SIDH goes back to 2017 to David Zhao and Luca De Feo, where um, they are looking at the graph that we just had on the previous slide. And when you're looking at um, super singular curves over fp squared, then each j invariant, well, when you're looking at L isogenies, then from each node, there are exactly L plus one um, edges going out of it. Um, there are these L plus 1 isogenies of degree L from any curve. Now, that is because we've chosen our primes such that, well, okay, since we're looking over any fields, um, we know that the um, group of L torsion points corresponds to Z mod L times Z mod L, and that just means they are L plus 1 subgroups of order L. And so each subgroup uniquely corresponds to an L isogeny, subgroup of order L corresponds to an L isogeny, and that's why we have these L plus 1. In some exceptional cases, you can have that two of those map between the curves, or you can have that you even have like one isogeny going back to itself, but in the normal case that we normally, what we consider, we will not have those. And we don't have the sense of direction anymore. So in the seaside case, we have like walking counterclockwise, or clockwise, just the two options. But now for the L plus one, for the L isogenies, we just have these L plus one directions. So three for two isogenies and four for three isogenies. Now we want to have something which looks similar to a different key exchange. So we all start from the same curve, and then Alice applies an isogeny indicated by a subgroup A. And Bob applies an isogeny K in K by a subgroup B. And so this E mod A and E mod B are the same that we've had for the seaside curves. And then we want to all end up on a curve which corresponds to E mod by the subgroup of A and B. So these are the steps that we want to have happen. Um, and the first arrows are kind of obvious. So the phi A and phi B starting from E, well, they all pick the, the subgroups. And then doing this is some, some long isogeny of this isogeny graph. One problem appears, and you see this already in the diagram, namely that the values there, well, this is phi A prime, because this is not phi A, because it starts at a different curve. And similarly, this is phi b prime. It starts at the e mod a. It does, it's not just the same as this one. We want to replicate this isogeny over here. We want to replicate this isogeny over here. But ooh, let's assume we somehow can do this in the next step. So somehow Alice figures out 
what a first subgroup looks like under Bob's isogeny. And Bob figures out what his subgroup looks like under Bob's isogeny. So Alice finds her A prime corresponding to this A under uh, on this group. So under Bob's isomorphism. This must exist because when we can push points through, so all of the points in A will be pushed through Bob's isogeny. And if we choose the um, the subgroups from Alice and Bob so that uh, Alice's points will not vanish under Bob's isogeny, say Alice uses two isogenies and Bob uses three isogenies or two power and three pi isogenies, then Alice's kernel will have points of order two and Bob's kernel will have points of order three, so nothing will happen to Alice's points. If Alice and Bob get these, then they can compute their shared secret, which is well, corresponding to this corner in the commutative diagram, um, going for, well, taking Bob's curve mod with the image of Alice's group, or taking Alice's curve mod by the image of Bob's curve. Now, if you compute this as an image, make sure to take the J invariant, because the actual curve that you end on can look quite different. But, well, the nodes are under isomorphisms, and so we just compute the JA invariant of this curve. Okay, um, so well, how do we deal with this? How can we get Alice to have this A prime? I mean, Alice knows her A, but this is also her whole, whole secret. Well, knowing A, you can compute phi of A. So this is the one secret that Alice has, and Bob, well, he has the isogeny. But that's also his secret. So how can they possibly get together? And this was a smart idea in the John the Fail paper, namely realizing that hey, these um, these subgroups. If Alice goes for two as uh, two power isogenies and Bob goes for three power isogenies, then we can just span all the two torsion points or two power torsion points with some basis P and Q. So Alice picks her subgroup as a linear combination of some basis p and q of this l torsion space, or in case, say, 2 to the n torsion space. And we know, since 2 is co-prime to a large prime p that the group order will have, that the, that the fine field will have, that there are 2 to the n times 2 to the n uh, as the group structure, so z mod 2 to the n times z mod 2 to the n. So if we look at the basis for this, then we have two elements, and then just scalar multiples of those spanning the whole whole range. And so if Alice picks her secret subgroup as generated by this point, so the secret comes in, this is lowercase a, which is just an integer between 0 and, well, the degree of her isogeny, which I said should be 2 to the n, then this is as random as anything. Well, okay, she's not getting a pure Q power, um, uh, p, uh, pure Q multiple, so she's missing the zero times P plus something times Q, but she gets L out of the L plus one different subgroups. And then Bob can include um, this in his public key. So P and Q are public, these are the bases, and Bob includes these images, they're called auxiliary points, in his public key. So he shows how his secret isogeny operates on these points. Well, and given those points, then Alice can actually compute her A prime. So A prime, well, we want to know what is the image of the group. Well, the group is generated by a point, so we just need to know what is the image of this point. And isogenies are homomorphisms. So if we know phi b of p and phi b of q, then this is phi of Alice's capital A, well, and so we know what A prime is. Or here with the graph, so if we have the A subgroup corresponds of exactly the um, elements which are 1 times P plus A times Q, or 2 times P plus 2 A times Q, etc., so A is exactly corresponding to this line, then L A prime has the same slope just using the images of P and Q under Bob's secret isogeny. Yep, 
I'm feeling crazy about this too, but so far nobody has found a really strong attack using these auxiliary points. It feels kind of scary to uh, publish more information about Bob's isogeny other than just saying, hey, you land on this curve, because there is extra information by saying, hey, I don't tell you what my isogeny is, I just tell you the starting curve and the ending curve, and I also tell you how it operates on these two particular points. And if you have any good idea, Please do try to write it. So here is the one slide overview of what we actually have. I have already mentioned that Alice is using 2 to the n isogenies, Bob is using 3 to the m isogenies in this case. And so we want to have that both of those are divisors of p. So similar to the side, we're picking very special primes. So we're looking for primes p which have this shape. So power of 2 times power of 3 minus 1 is prime. And then we go for the case of super single elliptic curves, which have p plus 1 squared points. Ah, so that's nice. If it's p plus 1, so that's just 2 to the n, 3 to the n, and then squared. So we're having exactly 2 to the 2n, 3 to the 2n points. And that means that the bases of these 2 to the n torsion and 3 to the m torsion are all defined over this fp squared. Okay, so. That means all our computations will be of over fp squared, and we choose our p squared, so well, that's secure, but we have the control, it won't get larger than that. Okay, and so then we have the bases for the 2 to the n power, power torsion here, 3 to the m torsion here, and then, well, Alice has to push Bob's po base points through, Bob has to push Alice's base points through, and then this is how actually this key exchange looks like. So both of them get their secret as a J invariant of this curve. And because, well, the A prime is compatible with the A, the B prime is compatible with the B, they will just get the same, well, the same J invariant. Now, computing a 2 to the n torsion, I mean, that sounds very, very expensive because well, P has to be so large that these are now brute force searches happen. And that means that P, again, also for, for its IDH, has at least five twelve bits. Well, okay, 400 something bits. And for the formulas we know take time linear in the size of the group to compute this assertion. And so that would mean we're computing something which is kind of square root of P. That sounds really, really expensive. Nicely enough, well, if it's a power of 2, we can compose this similar to what we have seen in the, the, the C side case. And it should be very clear that C side came after its IDH. So this is the original, which is doing all these small isogenies. Well, okay, CRS, so Quvenius, Stolpen, and Sivostopsin was first um, in doing this. So we want to compose this 2 to the n isogeny from lots of small isogenies. So this phi g or by A, I should say that this is like what Alice will be computing. We want to do as, as many steps as a degree. Well, okay, that's n steps for Alice, m steps for Bob, and so running through all of these steps. Each time computing just the two or three isogeny, but we need to make sure that we're pushing, that we pick this group once and then push it through. So we want that the kernel from this map over here is matching. So we're taking the original group that we have here and then looking at the next kernel well to fit this. And so it's not just computing one L1 isogeny but we also have to take points through this. So in principle well you're seeing K so for you L to the K isogeny here you're seeing K steps each costing L or value but also you have to push the points through. So that's why we get a naive version k squared there. And you can get it down to k log k by doing some optimal ways of how you compose computing isogenies with pushing points through and so on. So the keyword here is optimal strategy. So that then is more efficient and definitely a lot more efficient than computing a 2 to the n or 3 to the m isogeny in one go. So Nicely enough, everything is over fp squared, so all your arithmetic is there, but still, well, 
and it's with small isogenies, so it's two isogenies, three isogenies. And in this case, we don't have the problem of finding a point because we're giving the spaces and we're pushing the spaces through. So the part about C side where I was commenting on, it takes some time to find points of the right order, is a non-issue in SIDH because we have an explicit basis. Okay, so security. So how big is our key space? For C side, I was saying it's square root of P, and here it's it's similar to what we have there. So here, well, you wouldn't know it's P squared, and it's the square root of that. So it's just something of size P, and actually it's pretty precise to so you P over 12 rounds down, and then there's some epsilon, which is actually also pretty clear. However, each of these, these walks that they're doing, so Alice is just doing 2 to the n, Bob is doing 3 to the m, and remember that P was 2 to the n times 3 to the m. So that means they're actually reaching only square root of P many keys. So you're working over F P squared. The number of different curves in this graph is P, but each of them can only reach square root of P. So in some sense, it's only a small corner of the curve space. So if you like, okay, well, if you're looking for a search, like a brute force search, it's only P, the square root of P many keys that they have to search through. A nice part is, well, these isogenies can get pretty far. So these graphs have nice properties about mixing, but still the walks are comparably short. If you're looking at classical text, so pre-quantum attacks, then, um, well, you can do meet in the middle attack in square root of that, so square root of the square root of p, so fourth root of, of p. However, you also need that much space. So that is actually worse than in seaside, and it comes from the fact that there is no sense of direction. So for seaside, you get a fourth root of p without memory, and here it's fourth root of p time and memory. You could try to do this kind of collision finding where you well, do something more in parallel, and then you're getting a complicated formula. But okay, so it's, it's fourth root of p, but an expensive version of it. There is something to watch out. So in C set, I was highlighting that you can be sure that Bob's or Alice's key is valid. Here, you can actually not make sure. So this is going to be a, a full slide with the attack. And the quantum attacks, um, well, there is something called claw finding, so Tani's algorithm which um, looks like it's sixth root of p, so the cube root of the key space. But um, Jack, Simon Jackson and uh, John Chang were showing that if you would actually have all of this circuitry to run Tani's algorithm, you could just use the circuitry, the classical part, like the control hardware that is above the quantum computation, and then run Panorchic Wiener, which is a classical attack for, for searching. So the meet in the middle attack up there. So also under quantum attacks, it doesn't get any faster than the fourth root of P. So that is good news for the security of SIDH. Um, the next slide, which is about the usability, well, it can be dealt with, but it's something to watch out for. And the meet attack. So how could Bob come up with something that makes him get information from Alice. And you have seen this kind of reaction attack in the case of code-based crypto, or comeback analysis is something typical to consider. So how could you do this with SIDH? So remember that Bob is sending these auxiliary points to Alice, and he's supposed to take just the basis of that. And then she picks this to compute her group. But what if he cheats a little? So let's assume he's sending um, Q prime, or the image of Q prime, which has this whole contribution of P. Then again, Alice is computing this value. And now this A goes on that part. So let's see what happens there. So if Alice's A was even, so if A is two times U, then the A times this, A Q there, so the, not the proper image of Q, but the image of Q with a P prime, then, well, this was a power of 2, so this was 2, and here's the 2 to the n. Well, p has order 2 to the n, so the contribution of the p prime disappears, and this is just the same as she would have computed on the proper point q prime. However, if a was odd, then the q double prime is wrong. So the a q double prime is wrong. It's this extra value here. 
But all you can test is that it's a point of the right order, and this is still a point of the order to the end. So she has no way of figuring out that this is there. And by seeing how what curve Alice computes, whether it has this thing or that thing, Bob can figure out the parity of, of A, whether it's even or odd. Okay, now you know how to get one bit. Well, now you know the bit, so you fix that one, and then you instead of sending to the n minus one, you send it to the n minus two, etc. So you can recover A by just, well, as many queries as their positions, so in, in n queries. And there's no way of, of validating that B, that the Bob is honest. So if you would be able to figure that out, that is as hard as breaking the system itself. Now what Psyche, this uh, NIST competition submission is doing, is actually wrapping this in a cam, whether there's a transformation on it which proves that Bob is, is honest, but that's basically revealing his secret key. So Bob cannot use the same input to this key exchange with another Alice, because, well, first Alice would know his secret. And so you cannot reuse your keys. Either you as Alice are vulnerable, or you as Bob have just given Alice all the secrets. For comparison, so when you're looking at well the normal elliptic curve discrete log, the C side, and then some versions of SIDH that side about the sizes, then of course the pre-quantum security is really nice for elliptic curve discrete logs, just a scroll attack. For C side we have a fourth root attack. And here, well, we have a fourth root and P attack, but each key has an element over P square. And we have this auxiliary point, so the, the keys get a lot larger. But for post one security, well, they don't lose too much, and this is even using the sixth root, so if I ignore the uh, Tandy's algorithm, it would be the same values over here. And then the C side keys grow super linear, and the ECDH case, well, they grow through the root exponential because we have Shaw's attack. So find more tests on SIDH because. I would really, I mean, I like elliptic curves and it would be nice to have them in the post one world, but at this point there isn't enough attention. So Chloe Martindale and Lawrence Punny wrote a very nice paper about their failed attempts and maybe you can add a successful attempt.